Good afternoon and welcome to today's live webinar. I am Patricia Simpson, Director of Political and Career Programs here at the Leadership Institute. We're joined today by Nathaniel Yellis, All-American Debater and Heritage, Heritage Actions Deputy Political Director, and Isaiah McPeak, who is a debate coach and co-founder of Ethos Debate Publications, LLC. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us today. It's great to be here. Awesome. We are going to be talking about smart debate, confronting slick leftists in public arguments, the layman's guide to debating liberals in public. I'm very excited about it, and I hope that you are too. I know our live studio audience is. And before we get into it, I just want to remind everyone that this is, in fact, live, and you can ask questions at any time, but we're going to do it a little different this time. We're going to hold them until the end to let Nathaniel and Isaiah go through their entire presentation. You can email your questions to live at leadershipinstitute.org. They'll come directly to me. Or you can tweet your questions during the event using the hashtag LIWebinar. And you can tweet your questions to at leadershipinst, which is our, our Twitter handle, or at either of our faculty when their Twitter handles, handles are at inathaniel and at ethosdebate. And they will flash uh, from time to time on the bottom of your screen. Without further ado, gentlemen, what do you have for us today? So today, Patty, we're going to be watching a clip from Fox News. Judge Janine is a weekend evenings host on Fox News. And the clip we're about to show you was one that actually made me throw the remote at the television. It's a very frustrating piece of cable news because questions are asked and not answers. Statements are made and not challenged. And the thing is, at times, confusing. We're going to roll the whole clip and then break it down and talk about how we'd respond were we on Fox News with Judge Janine that night. Let's roll the clip. You know, while impeachment doesn't seem to be on the table yet, the controversy surrounding the White House appear to have re-energized the GOP. It appears that this White House is actually incapable of telling the truth. With me, Democratic strategist Ryan Clayton from D.C. and Republican strategist and Fox News contributor Tony Syedge. All right, Ryan, isn't lying to the American people over and over again more serious than a personal picadillo with an intern in the Oval Office? Well, I think your comparison to the Clinton scandals of the late 90s is a perfect comparison. Look, the last time the House Republicans did this, they lost a lot of seats in the next election. So I'd encourage uh, Speaker John Boehner to talk to former Speaker Newt Gingrich about how well that worked out for him when they did it to the Clintons, because the people pushing all of this scandal-laden politics against President Obama are going to pay for it at the polls, because Americans are sick of this type of politics but in America. But, Ryan, wouldn't you say it's a little more serious to lie to the American people over and over again than maybe having kind of like sex with an intern in the Oval Office that really wasn't sex? Yeah, I would agree with you. I think Good. lying to the American people and, for example, taking us to war in Iraq on faulty <laughs> evidence of weapons of mass destruction is something that people should be positively calling oh, for impeachment please. of a president for. How about for. leaving Americans and that's why on the battlefield those, in Benghazi and, and not sending and, help and going to bed? But that's another that, issue. But what do you people, say to Tony's comment that the second article of impeachment in the Nixon uh, uh, charge had to do with the abuse of the IRS and using it to target political enemies? Well, look, everybody knows that that comparison just doesn't really pan out here. The real, scandal, the real scandal at the IRS is the fact that they let all of these corporations pay zero oh, dollars in income Ryan. taxes every right, year. Well, Why, are Why are we calling for investigations on that? Why are we calling for investigations on that? Stop. That's the law. You want to change the law, go to Congress. I'm talking about the fact that you use the IRS to target a political right. opponent. Right. You're not I'm saying talking that. about the fact that Warren Buffett pays a lower income tax that's rate than his secretary line. does. And you know that's what's an effective, sad? That's you know a question sad? of the IRS doing subjective? its job, and they're not doing their job in that so, instance. Well, they need to make no, 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 the no, rich no, pay no. their taxes. You're wrong. You're wrong. Because what? You, all right, Ryan, let's follow it up. If you're saying the IRS is not doing its job, you're saying that Warren Buffett is doing something illegal and is guilty of tax evasion. He is not. No, all right? not I'm saying most of the wealthy people in this country, like Mitt Romney, keep their money in offshore tax exchanges. Why are the stations pursuing them? Why aren't they Let's them. talk about Mitt Romney, Ryan. How did they get that information on Mitt Romney? They used the IRS Correct. to get private information to benefit Obama again. 
Correct. My favorite part correct about making that comment is you're, seen you're admitting, in you're admitting that that information was correct. And, and let's you're also admitting say that information was correct. That Mitt Romney doesn't pay any taxes. Ryan is saying you just admitted that Mitt Romney paid zero dollars in taxes. Ryan, excuse me. Fair? I pay my taxes. You've tried to deflect enough. I think we got to go back to the matter at hand. Ryan is saying the incompetence of the IRS. Then why did we give them the control over Obamacare? Number one. Number two. You're you're really talking about a situation in which in the year of 2011, no Tea Party group, no group that had Patriot or Tea Party in their name, according to the Washington Post, got clearance from the IRS to actually operate as a group. That's Two because years. they're not charitable groups. Ryan? They're not they're not nonprofit organizations. Wait a minute. And, wait and wait Media wait Matters wait is, wait and a lot of the liberal ones Guys, are. They didn't seconds. even get notice Tony, to their status. I want you to Ryan. pull up. There's a New York Times. Some of these Tea Party groups are not likely innocent nonprofit organizations. They may be illegally spending resources on political activity. How do you make that accusation without an investigation? This because is the about Koch brothers, political targeting. The Period. Koch brothers gave money Ryan to the Democrats. Tea Party groups not to help feed the poor. They gave them that money right, to serve guys. the media political matters, agenda right. and the bottom line and of their businesses. Move on could pick all progressive groups, back. none of which, by the way, none uh, of which, by it. the way, are, are audited by the IRS. Up next, guys, we're going to have you back, not to worry. <laughs> So, gentlemen, you're going to teach us how to, to debate exactly like that, correct? That's an incredibly frustrating <laughs> piece of television. We're okay. going to teach you how to not debate like All that. Right. Or rather, how to respond when your opponent tries to debate like that. The first thing that we're going to do is Isaiah's going to talk through some of our philosophy about how to approach debate. I'm going to give us some tactics on how to implement that philosophy on your next cable news hit next time you're on Fox News. And then we're going to go back through that clip statement by statement and talk about how we'd respond. So let's go to philosophy of debate. Isaiah? Thanks, Nathaniel. You think probably I'm going to say the number one tip for having a principle before you get into an argument is have a point. But that's not actually the first tip. That's going to be tip number two. The first tip really has to do with your audience. You have to pick an audience. That's the first principle that successful debaters do. What is confusing in this clip is that at times each person in this debate changes from whether their audience is one of the other speakers in this debate or is actually the public that is viewing this debate. And either choice is okay. A discussion with another person is a valid choice of an audience and a discussion between two people in front of an audience towards that audience is also a valid choice but you have to choose one. So a lawyer, when they're in a courtroom cross-examining a witness, never forgets that the jury is the audience of that cross-examination. Their goal is not to persuade the person that they're cross-examining. I think McCain and Obama in their presidential debates really had one shining bad example of this when they got into this moment of apologies to each other for things that they or actually con su their supporters had said or done that made them feel bad. They stopped debating about what the content of the issues were that the audience was there and cared about, and they started instead trying to make each other admit things about each other. That's a mistake. The first most important tip in engaging in any debate is to choose who your audience is and forget about persuading anyone else. Then the second tip is to have a point and keep it narrow. For example, if I were here to talk about Argentina's economy, we're trying to take something non-political for just a second, and I said that Argentina's economy is failing, if my opponent brings up one or two economic factors where Argentina is actually doing rather well, then my point has been harmed. However, if I say, Argentina's GDP has decreased year on year. I'm supporting the same claim that Argentina's economy is faltering, but I am not overstating that claim with facts that I don't have. In fact, I'm narrowly having a small claim. Tiny claims, piece by piece, bit by bit, are how conservative ideas need to be debated and communicated. In this clip, we saw the debate start with taxes, move to Benghazi, move to wars in Iraq, move to Bill Clinton. The debate became about left versus right. You're never going to get anywhere in a debate like that because the claims aren't narrow enough to have any kind of movement or change in the audience's perspective over the period of debate. You're going to either preach to the choir or offend the enemy. That's the only possible outcome. 
Now, the third tip that I have for you is that arguments start at assumptions. And assumptions are really where an argument is based. This means you can't argue at the conclusion level. What we saw were statements like, uh, Benghazi, uh, the Iraq war. Well, that assumes that the entire audience shares your perspective there. What the art of argument is, is very different from personally coming in there and being right or wrong. The art of argument is about finding shared perspectives that your audience has and showing that those shared assumptions lead to a different conclusion than your audience has previously had. In other words, you have to go back to shared facts or shared beliefs and start from there and work your way towards a conclusion. This is challenging for many people because it depersonalizes the debate. It means it's not about you anymore. It's about helping people find what is something they truly believe, the ideal, the truth. You're stepping yourself out of the I'm right, wrong, and putting us all into, we agree on some things. Let's see where that more naturally leads to as a conclusion. But that's where the most credibility is found. A great example of this, I think, is really conservative principle. Because rather than arguing, should we be in this war or that war? Should we be spending money here or there? We should always be starting with basic principles that we can find agreement on. And if we don't start there, we're, we're just going to frustrate each other. So for example, right authority. Can we get an agreement that there ought to be the right authority that is duly granted to a government before that authority acts in any manner. In other words, the government shouldn't act unless it has the authority to do so. If we can agree on that shared assumption, then I think we can find many conclusions that lead towards a conservative position from that shared assumption. But if we can't agree on that shared assumption, then arguing about whether or not the government should be spending money here or there or, or in a war here or there is going to be fruitless because we don't have the same shared assumption to talk about those issues. So we have to argue from assumptions. My fourth and, and final point really is, what is success? Persuasion to be successful should result in a change. It should result in a change of viewpoint. So if at the end of any type of persuasive argument, you haven't changed, the audience hasn't changed, the other speakers haven't changed, then even if you said some true things, you were not successful at debating. So you have to approach the debate from this viewpoint. I've lost until I've won. The New York Yankees don't go and say, hey, we're going to win this game, so we're not even going to play it. If you agree to be in the public sphere and agree to debate, then you have asserted that you're going to prove your point. You're not going to start from an obstinate, stubborn, I'm here, I'm right, and there's nothing you can say that will change my perspective. Instead, reasonable debaters say, I'm here to represent a position. I think through a dialogue and a conversation that we will see my position probably is the most reasonable one. But I understand that I'm starting at 0 versus 0 on the scoreboard, and I'm going to have to prove my way to get those points. Debaters in the conservative arena often forget that, they forget that they're trying to win and change other people's perspective. And you need to start at a 0-0 scoreboard. Those are four excellent principles of how debate ought to be conducted. I'm going to talk about three practical tips of how we debate using those principles, and then we're going to drive back into Judge Janine and, and see if we can't do a little better than Janine and Ryan and their conservative guest. The first of my three practical tips is you have to earn an audience earn credibility in the eyes of your audience by first answering the question asked. No one starts on cable TV with ultimate credibility. They have to earn it. And you earn that credibility by answering the question. An example of this, the 1992 presidential debate. A question was asked about the national debt. President George Bush obfuscated, didn't answer clearly, and started throwing numbers at the questioner. The same question was asked to candidate Bill Clinton. He stood up looked into the eyes of the questioner and said, essentially, I feel your pain. That answered the question and that earned him the credibility. And arguably, that in that moment, the 1992 presidential election was decided. Second point is to keep it simple. 
when people are throwing all kinds of assertions, evidence, and questions at you, you have to think about the point behind the question or assertion that was just asked. You have to think about, if someone's watching this clip on television, what are they thinking was just said? What's the most important thing that was just said? And respond to that. Um, I think when we, when we roll the first part of the clip, we'll be able to see an example of that. My third and final tactical point is know what to ignore. This is kind of the flip of the thing I just said. Often in a debate, folks will throw in extraneous information, personal jabs, or facts that have no bearing on the question at hand. Know when you can just let that stuff slide. When people start talking really fast on cable news, often they're saying extraneous things, and the best response is just to let it go. So there's a lot that we can uh, dig into in this clip um, in terms of knowing what to ignore, keeping it simple, and earning the credibility of the audience. So, so let's jump right in. Let's roll that first chunk of the clip. You know, while impeachment doesn't seem to be on the table yet, the controversy surrounding the White House appear to have re-energized the GOP. It appears that this White House is actually incapable of telling the truth. With me, Democratic strategist Ryan Clayton from D.C. and Republican strategist and Fox News contributor Tony Syedge. So the question here is, uh, is actually in the next clip, so let's roll the second clip, too. All right, Ryan, isn't lying to the American people over and over again more serious than a personal picadillo with an intern in the Oval Office? Well, I think your comparison to the Clinton scandals of the late 90s is a perfect comparison. Look, the last time the House Republicans did this, they lost a lot of seats in the next election. So I'd encourage uh, Speaker John Boehner to talk to former Speaker Newt Gingrich about how well that worked out for him when they did it to the Clintons, because the people pushing all of this scandal-laden politics against President Obama are going to pay for it at the polls, because Americans are sick of this type of politics but in America. Ryan Judge Janine asked the question, aren't these IRS and Benghazi scandals really harming the ability of the president? At that point, she should have stopped. Because the next thing she said was, isn't that worse than sexual peccadilloes in the Oval Office? At that point, she ceded all ground to Ryan a liberal, because he could come in and start talking about the 1990s. Liberals have had, what, 15 years to deal with the Clinton scandals? They have a canned answer for that. They haven't had 15 years to deal with the IRS and Benghazi scandals, the Obama administration using the IRS for political gain. Judge Janine needed to keep it simple there. The Clinton scandals are not the point at issue. The point at issue is, is the Obama using the IRS for political gain? What's something that Judge Janine could have said that would have perhaps kept it more simple? Yeah. Hasn't the Obama administration yeah. lost its ability to govern? Haven't they lost the credibility of the American people by doing this? That's the question I would have asked. I think we see another point in this clip, too, when Judge Janine says, hasn't the credibility been lost by lying over and over and over again? And you see that this goes back to the fourth principle I gave you about not starting as if you've won, but starting as if you have to prove your points in order to win. When you start with lying over and over and over again, you're now making this a bigger discussion than the narrow claim of the IRS scandal, and you're making it be about, in general, do leftists lie, and not really doing the work necessary to earn the right to say that. And starting at a, I've already won this point, really detracts from the debate from this point forward. So Judge Janine has kind of lost it coming out of the gate, but let's see how she responds to the first thing Ryan said. Roll the next clip. Wouldn't you say it's a little more serious to lie to the American people over and over again than maybe having kind of like sex with an intern in the Oval Office that really wasn't sex? This discussion may make for good television, but I still think that Judge Janine is losing the credibility argument right here and trying to compare a really serious scandal that no one has a good response to with one that they have already, have already responded to. And remember, what are we supposed to be talking about? Are we really supposed to be talking about a sexual scandal from 15 years ago when I was a kid? This Probably is, not. The next clip, Judge Janine brings up something that I think is important, and we get to see how Ryan responds. Let's roll it. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think lying to the American people and, for example, taking us to war in Iraq on faulty <laughs> evidence of weapons of mass destruction is something that people should be positively calling oh, for impeachment please. of a president How about for. Leaving Americans and that's why. On the battle Ryan brought up something that's really critical here, and it's the Iraq War. Now, even on the conservative side of the aisle, there are a lot of different perspectives on the Iraq War. How does Judge Judy respond? She says, oh, please. 
Do you like that tactic, Isaiah? I don't think oh please is ever considered positive refutation. The only person that a response like oh please, especially to a serious issue where thousands of people died, the only possible gain you can have from that is a loss of credibility, but it's not your opponents, it's your own. Yeah, there's, there's a point at which you need to be able to refute someone without, without resorting to that kind of tactic. And an oh please says, you know what, I can't think of any reasons off the top of my head, so instead <laughs> I'm just going to obscure that fact. Just like the liberals have been preparing for the Clinton response for 15 years, I think conservatives can do a better job in the 10 years that we've had since the Iraq war started to respond to a, a mudslinging accusation like that. Let's power on through Judge Janine and roll the next clip. Kids Why? on the battlefield Those, in Benghazi and, and not sending and, help and going to bed, but that's another that, issue. What do you say to Tony's comment that the second article of impeachment in the Nixon uh, uh, charge had to do with the abuse of the IRS and using it to target political enemies? Ah, we're actually asking a question here. Now, what's most interesting to me is that we've been playing this clip now for several seconds. We're finally back to what the whole clip started with. Let me ask you this question. Do you think, let me ask you this question. Do you think that this debate was in any way enhanced in what happened since the very opening question and what happened at this moment now? Was that intervening time and what they said helpful in any way? I guess helpful if you view taking out the trash as okay. I feel like each <laughs> participant in this debate had stuff to say and they've said it, but we haven't really answered the core point at issue and we haven't really had any intelligent discussion of it to this point in the clip. So the debaters would have been doing better to keep it narrow from the very beginning back to the IRS and that issue alone. Absolutely. Now that they've finally gotten back to the point, let's see how they respond. Well, look, everybody knows that that comparison just doesn't really pan out here. How the real not? scandal, the real scandal at the IRS is the fact that they let all of these corporations pay zero oh, dollars in income line. taxes every right, year. Well, Why, are Why are we calling for investigations on that? Why are we calling for investigations on that? Stop. Stop. <laughs> Isaiah, I want to I want to hit you with that same question, or how would you respond, maybe? So. Judge Janine finally talks about the Nixon impeachment article, and Ryan says, everybody knows that's not a good comparison. Is that a good tactic? How do you respond to Ryan saying that? Great. So anytime someone says, everybody knows, the truth of the matter is it's kind of like saying the word clearly before you say something. It's, I don't really know what everybody knows, but I'm just going to go with it and try to obscure that I don't really have anything else to say here. So the best thing to do is not to get desperate, not to say, stop, it's instead to say, really? I didn't know that. Could you provide any type of support for that statement that everybody knows this? Exactly. That's how you call the everybody knows bluff. You've got to put it back in their court, but that's very challenging for these debaters who seem to be more interested in hearing themselves speak than in asking the other side a question. Now that Ryan's thrown the IRS, the real scandal on the IRS is tax rates, let's see what Judge Judy does next. Roll. That's the law. You want to change the law, go to Congress. I'm talking about the fact that you use the IRS to target a Correct. political opponent. Correct. You think Judge Janine has answered the question, Isaiah? She refuted Ryan successfully? I don't think she has. I think instead she's now making this debate personal. Do you see how she responded by you haven't answered, but really, this guest is here speaking on behalf of a broader you. He didn't do any scandals. He's here on television talking about them, but Judge Janine just made it personal by making it seem like he is here to represent what she has already determined is a scandal. You will absolutely never have positive traction from the moment you make your opponent into an enemy. Instead, you need to be talking about the ideas in a deep, personalized sense, not personalizing, especially what someone's not there to defend. I think what we've seen to, to date in this clip and, and where we are right now in, in this segment of television is that both sides are so entrenched that they're violating Isaiah's fourth philosophical principle of debate. Neither is capable of losing right now because neither is actually putting an idea on the table to be talked about. So what, what is it, let's just say, that you would have to, at this point, do in order for Judge Janine to be right. The opponent would have to say, you're right, I support scandals. 
That's the level that this debate has come to. There's no ability to have a common ground or shared assumptions once the debate is at that level. I would like to watch the cable news segment where someone comes out in support of scandals. I think that would be entertaining television, but probably not good debate. Let's march on through this Fox News clip and roll the next segment. You're not I'm talking about the fact that Warren Buffett pays a lower income tax rate than his secretary line. does. And you know that's what's an effective, that's you know a question of the IRS doing objective? its job, and they're not doing their job in that instance. They well, need to make money get rich. Time out. We need to know what to ignore. This, this tax-paying argument is totally tangential to the original discussion, which was, should the Obama administration be using the IRS to pursue its political enemies? At this point, we're talking about whether or not Warren Buffett pays taxes, and where, I would argue, using Judge Janine's words, way out of line. So given the non sequitur to Warren Buffett, how do you think, rather than everybody saying, no, 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 very loudly, what would be a better way to respond to the Warren Buffett argument? I would say that I don't know, because honestly, I don't know whether Warren Buffett pays taxes or not, or whether he pays more taxes than anybody else. And because it's not really up for discussion right now, I don't really care if I win the Warren Buffett paying taxes argument. Earn a little bit of credibility by saying, you know what, Ryan, I don't know about Warren Buffett. Let's talk about what we're here to talk about. I'd like you to flesh that out a little bit more. How can you win a debate by saying, I don't know? Let's assume the audience is real human beings. Have you ever talked with a real human being that literally knew everything about everything? I've never debated Wikipedia either. Uh, in order to appeal to real human beings, behave like one, and it's okay to admit that you don't know, especially when the point at hand is way outside of the line of discussion. Let's see how Judge Janine responds to the Warren Buffett comment. No, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. Because what, you, all right, Ryan, let's follow it up. If you're saying the IRS is not doing his job, you're saying that Warren Buffett is doing something illegal and is guilty of tax evasion. He is not. Ryan threw some red meat out there for Judge Janine, and she picked right up on it. And now they're having a fight about whether or not Warren Buffett pays taxes. One of my favorite parts comes next in this debate when we continue down this rabbit trail of paying the government your taxes. Let's roll it. No, he's right, I'm saying most of the wealthy him. people in this country, okay. like Mitt Romney, keep Could their money on offshore tax exchange. Why aren't the Let's pursuing them? Why aren't they investigating them? Let's talk, about Mitt, Let's talk them. about Mitt Romney, Ryan. How did they get that information on Mitt Romney? They used the IRS Correct. to get private information to benefit Obama again. This was the part where I actually had to pause the clip when we first watched it, and I had to walk away for a little bit because my brain hurt so bad because we've gone in so many different directions, I'm not even sure who's defending what anymore. There's a point here where I think more than three people are speaking at the same time, and it's a little bit hard to follow. But clearly, we've come a long way from the original point at issue. We're talking about evidence of whether Mitt Romney and Warren Buffett pay taxes, um, and whether Mitt Romney's tax information was illegally gotten by Obama. It, it's a little bit confusing, and I honestly think this is where a simple approach is key. What's the point at issue? How can we talk about that? How can we get off of these rabbit trails? Let's see how they actually respond to this rabbit trail. Roll it. Correct. My favorite part about making that comment is you're, seen you're admitting, you're admitting that that information was correct. And, and let's you're admitting also that say information that. was correct. No, that Mitt Romney doesn't pay that. any they taxes. Ryan is saying just oh my goodness. You're admitting that information is correct. That was repeated, what, three times? What information are we admitting was correct? I'm amazed that you even heard that. <laughs> I really am. <laughs> They're admitting that information was correct, and it's the information about Mitt Romney's tax return. How far afield are we now? Way far afield. Can anyone win this debate? No. No one can win this debate at this point. We've got to refocus. Do they refocus? Let's see. Roll it. I'm I'm the that Mitt Romney pays excuse zero dollars in taxes. Ryan, Is excuse that fair? Me. I pay my taxes. You've, you've tried to deflect need? enough. I think we've got to go back to the matter at hand. Ryan is saying the incompetence of the IRS. Then why did we give them the control over Obamacare, number one? Number two, uh, you're, you're really talking about a situation in which in the year of 2011, no Tea Party group, no group that had Patriot or Tea Party in their name, according to the Washington Post, got clearance from the IRS to actually operate as a group. I wish I'd heard that fact three minutes ago in this news clip because... If that's the case, then we need to have a discussion about whether it was okay. Isaiah? This is exactly the substance of debate. When we go all the way back to those principles, the shared assumption now becomes very clear why that's important. Because if that fact is true, then it probably violates an assumption that are shared by every person in that debate. That's finding that moment, finding that crux, is going to be where you can argue from 
for the rest of the debate. When it's brought up this late and we've had so much emotionalism and personalization of all the arguments going on, I don't think that this apropos fact is going to actually carry the water for the rest of the debate. Let's see how Ryan responds and roll the next three seconds. That's Two because they're not question. charitable and groups. Ryan? They're not, they're not nonprofit organizations. He responds to no conservative group was approved by the IRS with they're not charitable organizations. They're not nonprofit organizations. So now we've just finally started having the argument. Shared assumptions here. Should or should not nonprofit organizations be related to the IRS in the same way as other organizations? That's an argument that really doesn't say conservative or liberal on it so much as it says there's a reasonable, probable right answer here, and that's going to help us determine the answer to the debate overall. Let's see how Janine responds to Ryan's argument. Wait a minute. And, wait and minute, Media wait Matters minute. is, you know and what? a lot of the liberal up, ones guys, are. They didn't seconds. even get notice Tony, to their status, I want you to Ryan. pull up. There's a New York Times. Some of these Tea Party groups are not likely innocent nonprofit organizations. They may be illegally spending resources on political activity. How do you make that accusation without an investigation? Isaiah, did Janine pick up on Ryan's assumption? I think that to some extent she did, and it's really interesting that there's this preloaded uh, piece of, of news literature or evidence here that she's got ready to go. The most concerning fact for me though, even though we're kind of now on track a little bit, is who's doing the debating here? Who's doing the proving here? Well, first of all, you're on Fox News. Second of all, there's a conservative host who's not doing the talking. It's the, ho uh, excuse me, the conservative guest is not doing the talking. The host is doing all the talking. And third of all, we're kind of having these surprise pieces of evidence come up, which are valuable, but you're going to have to let it be conversational for it to be credible. Does Judge Janine allow a conversation about this evidence to happen and allow real persuasion to occur when she sees the other side unable to grasp with these types of things? I don't think we're going to see that. Well, let's roll the final section of the clip and see if we can rescue this debate. This because is the about Koch brothers, political targeting. The Koch brothers gave Ryan money to the Democrats. Tea Party groups, not to help feed the poor. They gave them that money right, to serve guys. the media political matters, agenda right? on the bottom line and of their businesses. Move on could pick all progressive groups, back. none of which, by the way, none oh, of which, by it. the way, are, are audited by the IRS. Up next, guys, we're going to have you back. Not to worry. I don't know if they rescued that debate, but at least Judge Janine got to throw in her last word, which was, "Don't worry, guys, we'll have you back." So the question is. Who won or lost the debate? I've already said that that's not really the point of the debate. It's about the ideas, but we still like to have that question for our, for our own emotional little fun chalkboard scoring. No one won this debate. It's a double loss because the point was lost the entire time through. Does anyone feel more educated and more knowledgeable about the IRS scandal and Obama? I'd argue there's only one fact we heard in the entire debate that really even helped any of us, and most likely, the audience involved already knew that fact if they were conservative and probably didn't have the time to digest that fact if they were liberal. So you didn't really see a change in the audience because the debaters did not provide an opportunity to do so. Yeah, I agree with you, Isaiah, on the double loss. I really wanted Judge Janine to win this. I really wanted Ryan to be refuted over and over again. But instead of refuting him on the point at hand, Judge Janine and the conservative guest refuted him on all of his sidebar arguments. They didn't keep things simple. They omitted almost nothing. And in the end, I kind of don't have much credibility. They haven't built much credibility with me, neither Janine, the conservative guest, or Ryan, the liberal guest. So. Double loss on a Fox News segment. Not all that surprising, but I think they could have done better. Patty, I think we're ready to turn it over for questions. All right. First off, that was amazing. So much information. We have requests from our viewers asking for copies immediately so they can review it at their leisure because you guys are very good. I've gotten text messages, emails, <laughs> and <laughs> tweets. Uh, so first of all, thank you for all of the superb information. Our first question is from one of our audience members and it's do you believe audience members who are untrained in debate base their perception of the winner 
disproportionately on the confidence of the speaker? Oh, I would love to take that question. Thank you for asking. The answer is yes, and it's proven with science. In the Nixon versus Kennedy debate, the televised audience, those who watched it with their eyes and saw the confidence and saw the poise and saw, honestly, the makeup, which Nixon refused to put on his face and it made him washed out, the televised audience all felt that Kennedy won the debate. Those who listened by radio overwhelmingly felt that Nixon had won the debate. The presentation, the confidence, the calmness that is exuded by the debaters has a direct impact on how the audience is willing and able to hear them. In classical rhetoric, that's called pathos. The idea of putting your audience in the right frame of mind to even be heard in the first place. And when I think of the debate we just watched, and I think, how would George Washington debate? Or how would Alexander Hamilton debate? I think that we're going to see there's a very different picture in those who are calm and confident in the idea they're there to propose, and those who are hawking little buzz statements about Benghazi, Iraq war, Clintons, and everything. That's a huge differentiator, is exuding confidence. Yeah, I think that in that clip, Ryan was coached into be really confident, and he took that to mean talk really fast, bring up everything you can think of, and never give an inch. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of the clip, you kind of think Ryan's winning, the liberal uh, guest is winning. But over time, you realize he's just packaged, and he's canned, and he's not actually thinking through what he says before he says it. So confidence, or what he perceives to be confidence, turns into a real loss. And that's probably why we gave him the double loss at the end of the clip. So would you say that listening is a measure of confidence? What did you say? Listening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all about listening. You've got to process what was said, pause, and then respond. And that poise that you gather in the pause, then respond, is what makes you really credible. Great. I have another question. Uh, it seems that newscasts are obviously fueled by ratings. And what we saw uh, throughout the entire presentation are horribly erratic debates. Those seem to be the trend. How do we stop that trend? It's interesting. I, I was watching Bill O'Reilly's show with my dad after seeing this clip a couple times when we were preparing for this, this uh, webinar. And in Bill O'Reilly's debates, there's hardly any crosstalk. He pauses and speaks. He rephrases the same question over and over again to a guest. And he has killer ratings, what the number one rated 8 o'clock hour show for, what, a decade, a decade and a half? And so I think you can get a little trashy on TV and have a mud fight like this and maybe draw a rating. But what people really want to watch is something slightly out of the gutter. And I would put O'Reilly at a class above what we just saw in general. And I'd add to that, too, it's, it's very difficult to prove with data anything about television because, honestly, a minor percent of people even tune into this type of debate at all. It's not exactly possible to say whether that's because most debate isn't engaging to them or for other reasons, but we do know that there aren't that many people who would even engage in this type of thing to begin with, and most of those who might, you know, try it out are probably going to be turned off by a shock and awe style of discussion that nobody's really comfortable with. Yeah. Now, speaking of shock and awe, is there ever a time to get angry during a debate? Does raising your voice or changing your tone affect the outcome or help your cause? I, Isaiah, have you ever raised your voice and gotten angry during I, a debate I round? Have, I have. I have. I've debated, I debated for about eight years total four in high school and four in college, and then I've coached for about 10, and I can guarantee anger does not work. There's such a thing as righteous anger, but it's not for you to display it. In a debate, it's about the ideas, not the people. So the most successful debaters I've ever coached, they are able to, actually I had one this past year, who was able to transition her response from when she felt the other team was twisting her arguments to where she was angry, and sometimes correct, but angry, and it was costing her rounds to, we came up with the word to use the whole year, bemused. Being bemused shows that the idea someone else is hawking, which may be offensive, is childish. You don't look down on them and you know, make fun of them or anything, but 
to find it somewhat amusing and immature what someone is saying as opposed to being angry about it is going to allow the next words that come out of your mouth to have huge impact instead of turning people off. When we were debate partners, uh, often Isaiah and I would be sitting at, the, at our table listening to our opponents talk and looking straight into the eyes of the panel of judges as they heard our opponents talk. And you can imagine in a collegiate debate round, people throw around a lot of different stuff and they'd frequently twist our words or call us liars in so many words. And I can remember like turning red and sweating and like breaking my pen, I was so frustrated. But you know what was happening when our opponents were trashing us? The judges were looking both at our opponents and at us at the table. So I would be there bright red and sweating in anger and Isaiah would have this really quizzical look on his face. He'd be like, really? And when judges looked at him and saw that, I actually witnessed it one time, they crossed out what our opponents just said on their notepad. Because they looked at Isaiah's face and his bemused really expression, instead of being angry, uh, won us that argument without even saying that story. That's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when. <laughs> um, this is a great question. In that specific debate on Fox, would a thoughtful person just refuse to continue? And if they did refuse mm. to continue, would they be considered a winner by some or would they be considered a wimp? That's a great question, especially the whole winner wimp thing. That was good rhetoric. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, Patty. The, the answer here comes from, I think, cross-examination in debate teaches us the most about this because that's the moment where debaters interact for three minutes and, and people can get heated and sometimes somebody doesn't answer your question. And the, the best tactics for cross-examination are not to say, I'm done. Not to you know, throw your papers on the ground and walk out, N none of that. It's actually to take a short, little tiny step back on your face, don't show anger, but signify that, you know, I'm not really part of this conversation anymore. It's not a conversation. If at some point you have the chance to answer, no, I'm not answering hypotheticals, or you haven't really let me talk yet, N nothing emotive, answer the question. But it will be through your audience identifying with you and putting themselves in your shoes and remembering times in their lives where they've been treated like that, that's going to boost your credibility. But storming out or refusing to engage isn't usually productive. You should just kind of let what happens happen and understand that conservative principles can fight another day and your confident calmness help them do that. I've seen a few cable news segments where the guest takes the microphone off of their jacket, throws it down and storms out. And as an audience uh, for those segments, in general, if I already agreed with the guest who just stormed out, I viewed that as a righteous win. If I disagreed with the guest that just stormed out, I viewed it as being a wimp. So if your goal is just, just to charge up your supporters, maybe storming out is an okay tactic. But if your goal is at all to convince someone who didn't agree with you beforehand to agree with you, I don't think I'd storm out. All right. And I have one last question. And this is one that's coming from me. When I was in college, uh, I used to debate with my liberal friends all of the time, and they would consistently throw statistics at me. And the night of our graduation, my most liberal friend said to me, Patty, I just want to say how impressed I was with you over the years because every single t statistic that I gave you was made up in my mind, but you always had something to say. Now, I don't remember, I don't recall what exactly I said to defend these, but what do you do in that when you, when you don't have time to fact check? People throw statistics or facts, figures at you that you cannot fact check there on the spot. How do you defend your argument in that situation? I, I love this question. You can take a first stab. If someone throws a number or a percentage at me, uh, math is kind of impressive, right? Oh my gosh, 76%? It can't be a lie. <laughs> what defeats math is logic. Because math is simply calculations on top of some assessment of, of the world. Let's dig into the assumptions that drive that assessment of the world, and we'll probably be able to find a way to untangle the actual math. Um, for example, you can always do this with polling questions. Are those registered voters? Are they likely voters? Asking that one question can untangle almost any poll result because inevitably someone is talking about all adults or registered voters when maybe for a campaign's purposes all we really care about are likely voters. I'd add to that answer just a little bit with your responsibility as a participant 
in debate. And I know that Patty probably worked hard in college to you know, master critical thinking. And it's not very difficult. And if you need to, go look up some terms by simply Googling statistical fallacies to be able to say, I have three or four questions about that number. And you can ask intelligent questions like, what was the sample size? Who conducted the survey or the study? Uh, who funded the survey or the study? Those types of questions can discredit made up or poor numbers. But at the same time, they show that you are an engaged participant. And if there are solid answers to all that, you know what? You kind of have to say, I don't know the answer here. And stick with your principle, but be willing to listen and look up those numbers and look for a counter later because that one moment isn't going to, it's not like all of conservatism is at stake in a single conversation. You have time to go look up alternate facts or see the truth of that study and so on. So your response needs to be a listening one, a questioning one, and a principled one. Excellent. Well, once again, thank you both for being with us today. Learned a lot. I'm glad that you got to answer my question. I was holding on to it till the very end. Uh, Nathaniel, Isaiah, thank you. And I would just like to say thank you to everyone who watched at home. I hope that you learned a lot of valuable information. This was recorded and you will be able to watch the recorded version on our website, www.leadershipinstitute.org. Slash activism on demand is our web archive of webinars. I want to invite everyone to come back here on Wednesday, September 11th at 3 p.m. We will be discussing crisis communications. Once again, a free webinar. Hope to see you there. Thank you very much. That was, that was very good. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you.